why we care about microengineering is because um, cells and tissues have a lot of complexity and cell, cells are small objects. So we want to, uh, when we want to make tissues, we want to have control over individual cells and what cells see um, even on different sides of the same cell. So we want to be able to have micro scale resolution. Once we have the micro scale resolution, we want to be able to have cells in an environment that they like. This is why materials like hydrogels become important. So hydrogels are basically polymers that are hydrophilic and they're cross-linked. So when you expose them to water, they swell and make a very um, hydrated network of polymer. Now, in many ways, hydrogels are similar to our own bodies because they're made from, um, our, our bodies are typically made from a lot of water and um, matrix materials that uh, are surrounding the cells and they're basically hydrophilic um, in nature, so they're hydrophilic uh, polymers. That's why when we have a micro-engineered hydrogel, we're dealing with uh, jello-like materials that we can control in very small length scales. And when you're trying to make tissues, sometimes you need that kind of resolution so that you can make something very small that has the right properties that the cells can interact with and the cells will feel like they're in the right environment, they feel like they're in, the, in their home, and then they can start feeling happy and recreating the right kind of function that they would in the normal body. So this is um, why we care about a concept of micro-engineered hydrogels, and that's how we can apply it to tissue engineering. Now, with respect to application of microtechnology to tissue and tissue engineering, the, the field has been going on for um, quite a number of years. The first real applications of micro systems to making tissues started back as late as 1950s, where people were trying to make um, basically little, um, little systems that can be used to regulate um, insulin in the body. So what people did back then was they took little islets. Um, often these islets were from um, organisms like pigs, and they wanted to somehow isolate these islets from the immune system of the, of the person. So what they did is that they took these cells and they started coating them with little gels that can isolate these from the tissues and would prevent the immune system from seeing them. So this was back in 1950. So this is when we first started to take microfabricated gels and apply them to uh, tissue engineering. The field has moved on over the years. There's, instead of just um, having a cell or aggregate of cells with a coating of gel on it, now we have a lot of technology to be able to integrate cells within these gels. And not only um, one type of gel, now we have a lot of different chemistries um, and we have a lot of tunability and controllability of how different gels and cells can come together to make tissues. So uh, with respect to um, microengineering, what we've done over the past um, um, a few decades is we come from those simple systems where islets were encapsulated in a gel to technologies now where we have, uh, we can use stimuli like light, we can use stimuli like changes in temperature and other things to be able to take a solution that has these polymers in it and somehow gel it so that we, they can they gel around the cell and we can encapsulate the cells inside it. Now, with the ability to make microfabricated gels, we can put different cells together in different ways. So the cells, you can have a, let's say, a liver cell and a fibroblast cell, and we can control how these cells come together, and then that will allow us to actually have these cells communicate with each other and help each other in becoming functional. So in many different tissues, you have this um, interaction between different cell types, and in these microfabricated gels, you can start recreating some of those things. With respect to um, the types of materials that, that, and advancements that have been made in this, now we also have the capability to take these gels and be able to isolate them from the same kind of proteins that make our own 
tissues. And so literally you're making gels that are made from materials like collagens, um, um, elastins, um, and similar kinds of proteins that make our own tissues, and as well as things like um, sugar-based molecules like hyaluronic acid and other things. So we actually have biological materials that make these gels, and we have engineering approaches to make them small um, in the way that we want. So we can use um, same kind of technologies that people use to make um, electronics, photolithography and other things that in which you actually shine a light on a uh, gel that cross links when it sees the light, and now you can fabricate these in very small length scales. Now once you have these, you want to be able to make tissues out of them. And this is why it's important to be able to assemble these gels in the way that um, it mimics a particular structure of a tissue. So let's say if you want to make um, something that looks like a heart, then what you can start with are you can fabricate little uh, spaghetti-like strings of gels that have heart cells inside them. And you can then pack these um, spaghetti-like strings into a structure that mimics a heart muscle tissue. And you can, of course, interface these with endothelial cells and blood vessel-like structures to make them. And this is why um, this um, kind of technologies of making these microengineered hydrogels are becoming more and more relevant in tissue engineering. So in the future, we see opportunities where you can take these microengineered hydrogels and use them for a range of different therapeutic applications by being able to take the right gel material with the right cell and right engineering technology, put them together to generate a, something that looks like the right kind of tissue that can be implanted. With respect to current problems that exist in this area, I think um, there's a types of problems that are associated with the material and cell interactions and how do we optimize that. And then there are problems regarding um, how do we actually go about fabrication of these things and their assembly. So in the material cell interactions, uh, we want the materials to, in many cases, induce tissue formation. So the way this happens in biology is that there is a lot of um, important and very controlled signaling that the cells are exposed to, to be able to um, assemble properly and form functional structures. So what we want these materials to do is to do the same kind of thing or be able to present the right kind of signals. Now, in some cases, um, some of the biology is known, but some of the biology is not necessarily known. And it's, there's challenges in trying to make the material that does the exact same thing that happens during embryonic development. So this is um, one of the things that a lot of material scientists and biomaterials people are trying to address all the time. Now how we try to do this is we can take um, lessons from biology of how, let's say, a particular protein does a function and we can try to recreate that function in our materials, whether by being able to take the same protein and having it inside the gel um, so that it, the cells get exposed to it, uh, what, and then being able to, let's say, randomly diffuse it, have it diffuse in the gel, or being able to take the protein or a functional peptide version of it and conjugate it to the gel so that the signal is actually doesn't diffuse away. It remains constant in the material that we want. So those are some ways in which we try to uh, address the biological challenge. With respect to um, the um, other things that we want to do with these um, cells, we want the cells, for example, to respond to the right kind of mechanical cues. So we can change the gel's concentration or a cross-linking um, approach to be able to control the mechanics of the material. And we know cells respond differently. They degrade the material differently based on some of these parameters. Now, once we make the gels, we want to be able to assemble them together. And we've done a lot of work in trying to find ways in which we can take these little micro-engineered gels and put them together to make larger uh, structures. The way our bodies are is that basically they're made from, every tissue is pretty much made from cells and different cell types often come together and make a functional structure. And we want, within these microengineered gels, we can recreate the same kind of functional structures. And then once we create one of these functional structures, we want to be able to put them together and make a larger tissue. So we've, some of the challenges in that area is um, how do we 
get these things to come together and have the right functionality. So there's a lot of work in trying to find ways in which these mini tries gels um, can be put together in the right way so that it, and then matured together so that they can interconnect and make the right function of a larger tissue structure. And there's um, challenges associated with how do we vascularize these structures that we get, how do we actually have a functional blood vessel network in there. So then there's a lot of work in trying to not only make the right tissues, but also integrate the right vasculature in there. And once you even do that, for example, being able to engineer a network of microfluidic channels inside it. So once you even have this network, how do we connect it to the blood vessel of the, of the host, of the patient? So you need some of these blood vessels to be having properties like being suturable. So the surgeon can suture this and then the blood can perfuse through the whole structure. And um, once, even if we get to that point, how do we address problems like blood coagulation and clotting of these blood. So you need the, endo, the endothelial cells, the blood vessels, to have the same properties as our normal blood vessels so that the blood going through these microengineered constructs don't coagulate. So there's a lot of challenges left, and I think that's what many people um, were going to be working with in the, in, the, in the next few years to try to address. As an example of how microengineered systems can be applied to a problem, let's say, um, recreating a heart, piece of heart tissue, um, we can think about it in the following way. So the heart tissue is um, basically a, a tissue that has a lot of muscle cells, and it's very well vascularized, a lot of blood vessels. So if you want to apply a microengineered system um, of these hydrogels to make the same tissue, what we have to do is we have to basically um, recreate the right kind of cell-cell interaction. So we have to organize these pieces of gel so then the heart cells um, align and organize and connect to each other so that they can, the right kind of electrical signal can go through these heart cells. And then we need to be able to integrate it with the blood vessel system. In that case, what we need to do is that we need to have the heart cells be in very close proximately with um, other cell types like blood vessel cells. So that, and then use these um, engineering approaches, particularly these microfabrication systems of, uh, to be able to assemble these uh, constructs and place the cells in the proper way. And if we can do this, for example, we can get a piece of heart tissue that potentially beats spontaneously because heart cells are designed to um, contract um, spontaneously, then we can have a piece of heart tissue that, um, let's say, a clinician can potentially implant into a um, um, defect site, a heart um, infarct or a um, piece of tissue that's dead because of heart attack. And um, that those are some of the ideas that tissue engineers think may be possible if some, some of these technologies develop further. <laughs>